strong, empowered, authentic. What's up, Ginger Nation? This is Tosh. This is Darren, and you are listening to the Authentic Ginger Podcast. Welcome to the Authentic Ginger Podcast. Ginger Nation, I'm Tosh Taylor. And I'm Darren Roach, and today I'm really excited for uh, for our guest. Uh, Aaron LaRosa is an accomplished writer of romance, but also a writer of two nonfiction books, Women's Skills and The Big Redhead Book. Aaron, I am really excited, actually, to learn about your books because I love romance books. Something Darren and I have talked on the show about before is uh, redheads in this kind of I don't know if there's this like air about us where people find, you know, us more romantic and more, not that we're, we as people are more romantic, but we're almost, I'm going to say sexier. Sexier is the word I'm trying to put out here <laughs> and I don't want to be oh, an fiery. asshole by saying it. Fiery. Exactly. So I have come across a list of the uh, most legendary redheads of all time. <laughs> Number one is Lucille Ball. Not a real redhead. I know. <laughs> But I always, I always love people who are aspiring to be redheads. Like I know Christina Hendricks has said in interviews, and I think Molly Ringwald too, that they just felt like they were born to be redheads. And as soon as they dyed their hair, it was like they felt comfortable with themselves. I think that's wonderful. Putting it that way, it almost like it romanticizes the hair color, right? Yeah. And then if you go through this list, actually, most of the people of the most influential redheads are not actual redheads or real people. For example, <laughs> Anne of Green Gables. <laughs> I was going to say Jessica Rabbit. Is she yeah, on she's there? on there. Of course <laughs> she is. Yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. Of course she is. Yeah. But Anne of Green Gables, I don't know. Did you grow up reading those books? No, I did read like like all the Pippi Longstocking stuff I was really into. And I, I would have my babysitter put like wire hangers into my hair so that my hair would <laughs> kind of like flip up. Um, but I do remember like I would watch the little mermaid every day after school um at a certain age because it was like i you know there weren't a lot of representation of of redheads when i was growing up it was sort of like we were either cartoon characters or sex pots and the representation was few and far between so i think that has changed a lot and um you see redheads all the time now and i know when i was researching my big redhead book um, I had found some statistic about commercials and redheads are yeah. used more than any other hair color in commercials because we stand out um, and they want to grab viewers attention. So I think that happens in a lot of cases, like, like with animated series and things like that. That's why you see cartoon characters as, as redheads a lot. Well, that is why Ariel made the list of the most influential <laughs> redheads. She definitely counts. She definitely counts. And then like, like if we keep talking about fake ones, uh, Car- Carmen Sandiego. Oh, was she a redhead? I didn't watch Carmen Sandiego. Oh. So this to me was a surprise. Cool. Uh, Fiona from Shrek also yeah, made the list. that's a good of one. Course. That is a good what one. What about like Merida from Brave? The whole family in Brave is their red hat. I know. I love that entire movie just because it's a good movie, not just because they're all gingers. But uh, <laughs> the last one I'm going to leave you with is is uh, Lois Griffin from Family Guy. She also made the list. Good I one. I forgot about that. Wow, wow. me too. Yeah. Way to go, Tosh. I know. She's kind Those of funny. Good redheads. They I'll are animated redheads. Yeah, they're solid. We're so interested to hear about uh, you know, your journey and your research um, that uh, led to the writing of this book. But prior to getting into that just a bit more, I, I'd love to dive into a little bit more of your, uh, your growing up with red hair. Like a lot of redheads, my parents don't have red hair. My dad grows a ginger beard. My parents are both brunette. My mom, I think from an early age, always talked about my hair and how it affected her life. Like she said, when I was born, she was so shocked. And she asked my dad, where did this come from? And my dad was like, well, my mother has red hair. And my mom was like, oh. And, you know, I think she was just like, who is this creature uh, with red hair? (laughs) My dad is Italian and he said that he was expecting like a little meatball of a baby and I ended up being a leprechaun. (laughs) You know, it was just talked about a lot and people would often, as I was growing up, stop me and uh, ask about my hair or want to touch my hair um, and ask my mom if we were 
my brother has red hair too if we were her kids um because she didn't have red hair at one point I know she did dye her hair red to to try and um stop the questions (laughs) yeah 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 um and then you know it was always as I got older then it became more of a nickname source which I'm sure you guys have experienced too in good and bad ways. I remember mm-hmm. my first nickname being Carrot Top, which like never made sense to me. Carrots have green tops. Right. Um, it's, yeah. it's ongoing. <laughs> it doesn't yep, make sense. Right. Um, and then in high school, I don't know what language barriers we can cross on this podcast, but um, whatever you want. <laughs> yeah. Fire, fire crotch was definitely uh, a point of, of uh, nickname and discussion. And it's like a lot of how um, as I got older in my 20s too when I would go to bars people would would bring up do the carpets match the drapes I mean it just like affected so many aspects of my life and people would call me red if they wanted to get my attention and I was usually the only redhead in the room did that get to you sure you know I think um it was always like deeply humiliating to have my pubes talked about openly when I can't think of any other hair color or person where that would be appropriate. You know, that was, that was tough. I think, especially as I met more redheads um, who became really good friends of mine, it became a source of kind of camaraderie and something we could discuss together and laugh about. I remember when I moved to LA, one of my first friends is this red haired guy and we worked together and we would go get lunch and people would ask if we were siblings and things like that. Um, And we would always say yes, or, you know, we would lie Uh and with stories. So I don't know. I think it ebbs and flows, but now I'm at a place where I, I like absolutely love it and I wouldn't change it for the world. And I get anxious when I think about like, going gray and losing my hair color or anything like that. So. Cause we all know, I think in your book, you mentioned, you know, that your hair will kind of skip the next phase of color and go direct to white. Yes, that's what we found because, um, and it was something I was interested in too, because a lot of times people will comment and they'll say, you don't have any gray hairs. Do you, do you color your hair? And I definitely do have gray hairs. They're just like woven into my hair and kind of look blonde. So um, yeah, redheads typically don't go the full gray. They'll go blonde or white, which is really interesting and fun um Mm -hmm. i i think i will be someone who dyes my hair when that happens yeah there you go so uh, it sounds to me like you know the the experiences you've had it wasn't awful and and at the same time it wasn't hey this is awesome but in the same token as you approach this the thought of this putting this book together and, and the research for it there had to be some mystique about you know what can i learn about this this um the red hair that i have that I can share mm-hmm. to the world. And one thing I really like that you've put out there as we start getting into this to this book is the fact that you call the redhead uh, culture a culture, a pop culture. I've been I've been told online um, over the last you know within the last since we've had our company, Authentic Ginger Clothing, that you know redheads it's not a culture. And I always say bullshit. It's a culture. <laughs> it is a culture. I want to get your take on that. And, and why you're so strong in thinking and, and, and putting it out there that it's a culture, it's part of pop culture. Let's, let's hear your take on that. I think, you know, red hair has a rich history of being part of culture. I think, you know, what I was looking at in my book is like, how did people treat red hair historically to get a sense of, was it important? Was it not? And what I was finding was like, you know, if you walk into an art museum and especially go to kind of ancient art, medieval art, all of that stuff, you're going to see a lot of red haired women being portrayed. Um, Mm -hmm. And then a lot of also redhead men uh, being portrayed, particularly in villainous roles for the men, which is really interesting. Um, But for the women painters, which was, you know, I would argue the medium of the time they didn't have tv they didn't have commercials to put redheads in but in order to get people's attention a lot of these artists would use redheads as models um and that would be how their their artwork would stand out which i found really interesting and then on top of that red hair was often used in shakespearean plays to uh symbolize jewishness uh, a, a lot of anti-semitism uh, actually was tied to having red hair it was a way on stage for um, 
people like Shakespeare to symbolize like this is a Jewish person and they have red hair like let's put them in a wig and show that which is fascinating to me um I know that it's something that isn't talked about as much but I think the way that women are treated versus the way men are treated with red hair is super different oh, um, and you were talking about like you know, I had mostly positive experiences. My brother at one point had dyed his hair blonde, I think because he was so tired of being the redhead. Um, and so I would never do that, but he was someone who had a totally different experience than I did. But in terms of us being a culture, you know, something I've experienced is like, I go to redhead festivals um, almost yearly before COVID. Uh, they have them not just in the US, but globally. Um, it's something where our hair is discussed, um, very openly. And I, I hate to bring this up, but the South Park episode, uh, Ginger Vitus, yep. you know, there's a whole episode of TV just about our red hair. And so we obviously are very much a pot, a part of pop culture. And when you think of, um, someone like Lucy and I love Lucy, you'll often just know her as the redhead. And I know Ricky used to call her my favorite redhead before every episode when he would yep. introduce her. And so red hair is not just an identity. It's something that people connect with. It's something that people are curious about and want to know more about. And it does have a presence in culture and especially pop culture, in my opinion, in art, in TV, in film and music it's more, it's more than a hair color. It's a way of life also, because it really does give you very specific experiences in your life that other people can connect to and celebrate. And I've definitely found that through publishing this book where people will reach out to me and say how seen they feel and how excited they are to celebrate um, our hair color, which is what I wanted this book to be about. I definitely talk in the book too about tough topics like ginger bullying and things like that but ultimately I wanted to create a book that explored our presence in pop culture and how we exist and also make culture with our hair color the title of your book is the big redhead book inside the secret society of red hair and I love that you called it a secret society because yeah, cool. it's true though and I'm sure you you feel it this kinship like I could walk into a room see another redhead and give a nod you know what I mean yes. like you don't yeah exactly you always have that smile or my daughters have quite a few redhead kids at their school and I just look at them and I'm like yep you're the coolest kid <laughs> in the room like <laughs> I do remember you know Julianne Moore is very active in redhead culture she created um, a book series I think called strawberry freckle face that is catered to redhead children and I think became like an off-Broadway show but she talked about whenever she sees other redheads she gives them a nod and they nod back and it's just this kind of unspoken hello language I understand you I've been through the same things we should talk we should hang out kind of thing but I love that too about being redhead nobody else has that that's ours I like that that is ours <laughs> yeah absolutely you, you've made the book uh, feel exciting right out of the gate okay so so to me I saw the cover I, I I skimmed through what I had seen inside and there's things that jumped out at me number one you have a couple some redhead secrets that are plastered in, in and out of there which I thought are really cool uh, one of them don't call us ginger unless you are a ginger yes I do believe that do you guys agree with that I don't mind being called a ginger I don't mind it at all but you're right I would much rather it came from another ginger <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. And you know what? I don't have red hair, but my all of my kids have red hair and they were the inspiration behind our our clothing company. And, uh, you know, for us, we, we, we hadn't really given it that much thought at the very start until we started uh, researching uh, the culture the redhead culture. And that's when it became pretty clear to us. Uh, we did get our hands slapped a little bit in Ireland when we wanted to look at uh, sending our clothing there. And uh, I was told by the, the consulate there that if you have the word ginger on here, uh, on your clothing, it's probably not going to, it's not going to sell well because we don't refer to redheads as gingers here in Ireland. Um, that's a, that's a root vegetable. So, you know, <laughs> best not to do that. And I'm like, well, yeah, I, I know it's a root vegetable, <laughs> you know, but, but you've made this book, broken it down into six 
sort of kinds of redheads um, as the, sort of the main base behind it, um, plus facts and, and fun stuff as well sprinkled in there. But the six kinds of redheads uh, you've mentioned are the redheaded vixen, the comic relief redhead, the fiery redhead, the evil ginger, the animated ginger, sorry, the animated ginge, and the lead ginger. That's Is right. it possible for you to touch on those six, starting with the redhead yeah. vixen? Yeah, so what I did was I looked at stereotypes that redheads tend to fall into when they are cast in pop culture. And only, I would say, within the last maybe five to ten years has it really changed that we've become the leading ginge, as I called it, I think, leading ginger. But um, I tried to really, like, look at gingers on TV film and see where they fell. So there's a stereotype of you being a total sex kitten and Jessica Rabbit, Christina Hedricks and Mad Men. All of those are really great archetypes for that. Mm -hmm. And what I talk about is that, and I've experienced this personally, but people will kind of assume that because you have red hair, you might be more adventurous in bed. You might be more likely to be a little crazy. Uh, I don't know if you guys saw Wedding Crashers, but Isla Fisher's character in that movie plays a crazy, sexy redhead who is willing to do anything in bed. Same thing with Allison Hannigan's character in American right. Pie, pretty iconically. So those are stereotypes about redheads captured in pop culture. And that's something that if you're a redhead woman, especially you'll probably get that from someone in your life, assuming that you are going to be this kind of like sexy vixen. You're, you're quoted as saying, never have I ever been called crazy in bed. <laughs> I think people have, will say things to me like, you know, when I was single and going out to bars, I would, I've had people say like, oh, I bet you're crazy in bed. Just without knowing me, like kind of first thing, it was interesting because I was looking at some data points around, I think it was Match.com or OkCupid had released data around, you know, who's the best kisser, who's the best in bed. And the data pointed to redheads or who's most adventurous. And when I did a little digging into that, because I wanted to know why that would be, there's a few reasons like, you know, A, uh, if people are projecting on you that they think you're going to be wild and bad, that might put an expectation on you that maybe other hair colors don't have to actually do that. But it also might give you the freedom to kind of express yourself sexually a little bit more because people mm. have this open mind about you. But then I also, when I was looking at Match.com or OkCupid, what I found was that they included natural and uh, dyed hair colors in that data so if you were a dyed redhead you were included in that which I thought was really interesting because then you can kind of come to the conclusion that maybe if you're willing to dye your hair red it's like you want to embody one of those stereotypes like that kind of sexy person and so that might skew the data where it's like maybe not all natural redheads are actually wild and bad but it's sort of like this hair color allows you to be expressing yourself because of the stereotype. Yeah. And they want to, they want to live up to the persona. Yeah, exactly. That's right. Yeah. This episode was brought to you by authentic ginger clothing. For more information on authentic ginger clothing, go to www.authenticginger.com. Yeah. When I talk about the leading ginger, kind of what I mean is, is that you're just a, allowed to exist as a human without the pressure of your red hair creating a stereotype. So I think great examples of that are Donald Gleason, who um, was in a great romantic comedy called About Time that I love. And he just stars as a love interest. There's no real mention about his hair color. He doesn't fall into the like comic relief redhead that a lot of men are forced to be in. He's not the evil ginger. He's just allowed to exist. And so I talk about the leading ginger as kind of the turning point in pop culture with us being allowed to exist outside of our hair and just have leading roles that are not tied to one of the other stereotypes. You know, what's funny about that right now too, uh, is that a leading guy in Yellowstone, right? Rip 
they're not allowing them, him to have his red hair in it, ah. which I wonder though, if his hair was red, what people would think of him when they still feel the same way about him. And would they write to that also? Right. Yeah, exactly. So it's kind of interesting. You're right. The, the lead. And that makes me think of like Ewan McGregor too. He's been the lead in movies, but never with his natural hair color. I didn't even know he was actually a redhead. Yeah. And it is fun too. Like I, I was talking a little bit about, I didn't include Riverdale in this book because at the time my editor was like, oh, what if it's only a one hit wonder and whatever it's gone for many seasons, but they had, um, you know, Archie is not a natural redhead, but they have him dye his hair, which I think is really great. And the same with Jamie in Outlander. Yes, he true. is not a natural redhead, but gets dyed hair jobs, which I love. Me too. Oh yeah. I, I do cite <laughs> that as part of the, yeah, exactly. He's great. But I cite that as part of the turn that we're seeing, which is sort of like people are actually now excited to see red haired men. And I talk a lot about red haired men in the book because there's such a an untapped resource in the world and they're so beautiful and they don't usually get the um, respect they deserve. So I think we're starting to see that change. Why do we think we're seeing that change? Why? That's a good question. Is it Ed Sheeran? Is it, is it guys like that? that I are knew there? you were going for that. I, I know you did. I know you did. <laughs> I, I'm 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 destined to make sure or to find out for sure that Sheeran has something to do with this. Well, you know, I actually cite uh, Prince Harry as probably being a big uh, turning point for that. Do we yeah. have a Prince Harry fan here? Yeah, me always. Too. Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, I think he has really changed the narrative around men with red hair. And I remember, I'm a really big royalist. I like love doing research on that oh, and dear. finding out more about them. I know. <laughs> We're going to be good um, friends, you and I. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. But, you know, like Prince Harry, when when he was born, Diana's ex-husband, Charles, said, oh, he's a, he's a ginger, too, and was just, like, really upset about the fact that he had red hair. And oh. so I think it's kind of lovely to see that he's not only come into his own, but has become this, like, massive sex symbol and... I really do think he is part of the reason of why that narrative changed. And maybe a little bit with Rupert Grant and Harry Potter, you know, like I think right. people who were coming of age with Harry Potter, he's so cute and charming in that series and is now like a handsome adult man. But I think those two are, are really something. And Ed Sheeran, like, I think he's super hot. I know he's like a polarizing figure for a lot of people people like either love his music or hate his music but it is interesting when people talk about him and I did look into this like if they don't like him they always bring up his red hair as as like a thing um and they don't say like I don't like him because he's a redhead but they'll say like that ginger or like that red you know they just like bring it up as like a negative thing about him which you know tells you how people still view red hair and that especially for men it can be a negative thing but it's it's interesting so then we look at conan o'brien which uh which you you do focus in on under, under the comic relief yeah so the comic relief redhead is a role that is played equally by men and women uh, on the redhead spectrum we already cited lucy right but um there are a lot of great comedic uh women out there and i think for men it's a role that is kind of like the class clown side characters where I saw a lot of red haired men and women in film and TV popping up was like, they were never the leading person maybe in the like eighties, nineties, but they were always the like kind of comic relief character who would come in and kind of be a little bit hapless. And we also saw this even in, I was looking into like Greek and Roman plays and they would often make kind of like, <laughs> this is the, the like evolution of it, but initially it would be like the hapless kind of like, dim-witted person would be on stage in a red wig and it would often symbolize um someone of a lower class and so they would play kind of the comic relief on stage and so there's this like very well-worn tradition of that and then when you look at clown culture um it's part of that thing of like what will stand out to an audience or what will catch someone's eye and so historically clowns have often donned bright red wigs um it's not only that it's eye catching, but a lot of it ties back to this idea of if you if you look at someone like Ronald McDonald, 
what what is that surname right that's going to be scottish mm-hmm. and so scottish right. people have a lot of red hair so it's it's all like not a coincidence that clowns have red hair it's all by choice it's all based in history and fact and it's really interesting who is who would be an evil ginger sorry yeah, Josh. So this, is that you is it me, is it me? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, I was looking back a lot at ancient art depictions of that. Mary Magdalene is often uh, depicted as a redhead. Uh, Judas is often depicted as a redhead. And then in terms of evil redheads, I mean, I, I hate to bring up the South Park episode again, but Ginger Vitus is all about basically an army of <laughs> rabid evil redheads. And that idea of like, not having a soul or stealing other people's soul. You'll also often see like witches will be depicted with red hair. You know, if you are watching Hocus Pocus, that Midler is going to be an iconic kind of evil redhead. Yeah. But that is something where where people um, might think you're up to something or might think you're being mischievous. Uh, I remember growing up, there was the Chucky doll series, which is still around today. Chucky is a redhead. So anyways, it is it is one of the more unfortunate depictions or uh, stereotypes of red hair, but it definitely exists in pop culture. Right. I think, Tosh, you're the, you're the second to last one here. We haven't discussed the fiery redhead. Oh. <laughs> yeah, have maybe you, that's free. So, Tosh, have you been accused of being a fiery redhead before? It, uh, that actually is in my Instagram profile, <laughs> that, I'm a, right. that I'm a fiery redhead. But it's not, uh, and actually, one of the, you know, things that are said about redheads that I don't like is that that we have a temper. And right. I mean, I definitely have a temper, but I, I, it's no different than anybody else's, I'm sure. That's right. Yeah. I think I'm fiery because I have a lot of energy. I yeah. have a lot of energy. I'm I'm loud. <laughs> so that's where I would take fiery from. Not not from like an anger fiery kind of stance. That's right. Yeah, I have definitely gotten that. Um people like, you know, I've been in meetings where uh I've been opinionated about something and someone will bring up my fiery temper. Um and it's sort of I think a deflector and uh a way that people can kind of categorize you, but this is a stereotype that I've experienced kind of any time I get mad about something. I'm the fiery redhead. Um, and so sometimes I've learned to use it to my advantage. Of course. And I'll like, you know, if I get mad at something irrationally, I'll blame it on my hair, which is very convenient. Um, but we definitely see depictions of that in pop culture as well. I think probably, you know, anyone can think of like a sassy redhead character um someone coming up with kind of like witty jokes or taking someone down I always think about Joan on Mad Men but she always had the most biting remarks it's kind of a fun stereotype to have kind of not (laughs) Uh, and fiery can be like you said a really empowering word it can also be used to kind of like take you down a peg so Use it wisely if you're going to call someone a fiery redhead. Yeah, exactly. And it's nice to use it, uh, yeah, in a way to to get people to keep their distance, too. And, if, you know, right. if you wanted to. Yeah. <laughs> I don't need everybody to like me. I'm okay. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then the, the last one that I just want to touch on, Aaron, is, and I'm going to quote you again, it's now no secret that animation and red hair go together like marshmallows and chocolate. I love that. You know, I guess it's no secret, and I've done some research with this as well, um, that there are, and I, my claim that I've made that, that is out there on the internet, uh, and which I found was that there are more redheaded Disney characters than any other, ki- or princesses, I should say, sorry, than any other princesses uh, within the Disney uh, franchise. So what are your thoughts? Yeah, so that's that's not exactly true. <laughs> there are more redheaded princesses than uh blondes and then i think it's brunettes but actually the princesses with the most have black hair and i do have kind of like a chart in my book where i dissect it but what i said and what you're tapping into is like you know redheads are two percent of the world's population and by that measure we should have like one princess maybe but we have um, many, many princesses. And so um, disproportionately, we are more represented than any other hair color. Um, up next would be like, in terms of rareness, like blondes 
than brunettes kind of thing. So um, we definitely get more representation than all of the other hair colors, I would say. Right. Something that is kind of a, a known fact, but I found interesting and still do is that when they were drawing Ariel and trying to figure out what her hair should be, they originally had her as a blonde and they decided to change it to red because I think there was a movie that came out at the time. Maybe it was Splash with Tom Hanks and that had a blonde mermaid. And so they decided to change direction and they thought red hair would, was actually popping more on screen um, and would be fun for that. I am mesmerized by this book and obviously the copious amounts of research that you had to do for it. But I'm right. wondering how hard was it to find this information? So I spent six months total uh, writing and researching the book. Before that, I had done a little bit of research, but what was really helpful was I would reach out to professors at different universities. And like, for example, I was really interested in this fact that I had read and I wasn't sure if it was true that more that redheads were burned at the stake during the witch trials because right. red hair was a symbol of witchcraft. And so what I found was like, there's no actual evidence to prove that there was no paperwork or anything like that, that says like, if you're a redhead, you get burned. But what the professors had told me was like, anecdotally speaking, uh, during the witch trials and historically too, it's sort of like, otherness or things that make you different make you a target and so they had said like it does um stand to reason that sure like if you had red hair that would put an extra target on your back and probably that did happen in a lot of cases so you know the way that I found information was like reaching out to experts looking at uh, studies that have been done because there have been genetic studies around red hair um, and people were very excited to talk to me about it. Um, and there are other red haired authors who had written books about red hair that I reached out to. But the cool thing about the redhead community is like people want to talk to you about it. All you have to do is ask. Is there anything like huge that you had believed your whole life that you realized when writing the book was not true? There was this fact that I had read that redheads were going extinct. So like I remember like hair color had shot up like people dyeing their hair red and what I found was that <laughs> that was not true it was this kind of propaganda thing put out by Clairol and other hair color companies um, to yeah. sell hair dye and so because that's when you look at the data it's like that's not actually how uh, recessive genes work they don't they don't just like weed out they like you as a red haired mother, me as a red haired mother, I've passed those genes on and they will continue to thrive. And so we are not going extinct. It was all a big scheme by hair color companies and they resurface the study like every couple of years. And sure enough, like sales of red hair dye will go up during that time. So that's interesting, isn't it? Wow. Totally. I didn't know that. Yeah. Something I didn't yeah. know. What I did think that I knew is that 40% of the world's population carry the MC1R gene. So I know I'm a carrier because my wife and I uh, have had uh, three redhead children and wow. we don't have red hair. Congrats. And Yeah, and I also have <laughs> – thank you. Uh, and I also have a son uh, from, a, from a prior marriage um, who has red hair. So I'm wow. 100% certain that I You're carry so the lucky. gene. You're so lucky. Yeah, I really am. I feel really fortunate about it, to be honest. Yes. And then neither one of my kids ended up with red hair. So <laughs> I know my, my daughter doesn't have red hair either. Sometimes people are like, is she a redhead? And I'm like, no, yeah, not a redhead. Like, I, I try. try to see it. They're like, is she? Yeah. yeah. Holding it in the light. Like when my, my youngest, my oldest is through and through a blonde, but my, my youngest is very <laughs> strawberry. And I'm like, every time her hair yeah. is wet, I'm like, tell me it's not red. It's red. It's like <laughs> she has a lot of the red undertones, but she, my mom is like, Tosh, it's, like, it's beautiful. There's no denying it, but it is not your hair, honey. Like, <laughs> my mom said something really funny that I loved when my daughter was born. She was like, and my daughter had very dark brown hair at the time. My mom said, oh, honestly, thank God. I'm so sick of redheads. <laughs> my mom had two redheads. And I was like, well, that's, that's awesome. good. <laughs> <laughs> but only someone that close to a ginger is allowed to say that. Can say that. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Okay, Aaron, before we let you go today, I, I want to talk about the new book because oh you have gosh. a new book coming out. So let's plug it because your episode is going to go live on Tuesday. So let's oh, talk great. about yeah. For Butter or Worse. Isn't that a great title? Yeah, so yeah, really I cool. 
I have been working on this book for probably two years. I love reading romance just like you. And um, this is a rom-com book. I pitched it as if uh, Mary Berry and Paul Hollywood from the Great British Baking Show had to fake date in order to save their careers, that's the book. And so oh it's God. a really fun <laughs> rom-com set in Los Angeles uh, with two hot 30-something reality TV show hosts. And it is just a delight romp to read. Um, so anyways, if you care to, please pre-order the book. It's available everywhere. And you can also add it on Goodreads. It'll be coming out uh, July of next year. So I'm really excited. I so love that I've gotten a chance to meet you. And I have already sent a copy like the I sent the link of your book to my mom and I was like you were just asking me what I want for Christmas I'm like this this is what I want for Christmas <laughs> thank you so much that's so sweet and yeah if any redheads out there ever want to talk about red hair I love chatting so please find me um I'm on Instagram and Twitter at Erin LaRosa lit and I'm also on TikTok at Erin LaRosa writes so I often post about my red hair and um love meeting fellow gingers I'm fearful that Darren is not going to be able to stump you on any of his stuff for today, oh, his gosh. facts that he has to do at the end of every episode. Are you scared yeah. to even do them, Darren? Because I would be. <laughs> well, actually, it's going to be Aaron and I against you. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I'll tell you why, because what I have for you today are a couple of quotes from Aaron's book, Uh oh, the big redhead book. And I want you to tell me who said them. Oh, no. Yeah. I think this would be really fun. You should know this, actually. Okay. I like redheads. Their mouths are like a drop of strawberry jam in a glass of milk. I know this one. T- I'll, you- give you, I'll give you a TV show. Mad Men. His name is John in real life, isn't it? You're thinking of John Hamm, but it was actually Roger Sterling. Oh, Roger. That was such go. a good series. But Roger would say that because he had the thing. He for, would. Yeah. It's yeah. one of my yeah. favorite lines ever. It's so <laughs> It's a really good line. Yeah. It's a really good line. I think, Tosh, I thought you would have had that, actually, because I know you're a bit of a fan of, of Mad Men. So. Yeah, it was a good, it was a good um, show. You should get this one. Uh-uh. You'd find it easier to be bad than good if you had red hair. People who hadn't red hair or haven't red hair don't know what trouble is. So she's 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 a, a mystic character out of Prince Edward Island. Oh, of course it was Anne. Yeah, Anna Green Gables. Okay, Lucy Maud Montgomery wrote that, not Anne. I shouldn't credit Anne for that. <laughs> awesome. Now the last one I have is is actually not a quote, nor nor is it a uh, uh, um, anything but a statement. And I and I want to get Tasha. I want to get your reaction from this. Uh, and this is from Aaron's book. Redheads smell different. You have said that before, and I disagreed with you, but I can't smell myself, so I don't know. <laughs> Aaron, yeah. I need to know. I need to know a little bit more about this. I was really, really interested in this. So there was a book that I read many years ago. I think it was just called Perfume, but it was about a serial killer who only wanted to kill redheads because they smelled different. And wow. <laughs> um, so I started looking into that and there actually was um, a perfumist who I think it was in the 1700s or 1800s had done, you know, his own study about the different smells that each hair color had. And he had said that redhead smelled earthier, that we smelled more like connected to the soil and the earth uh, than other hair colors. And so there's truth and not truth to that. So what I did find was that because of our melanin and the way that it affects our skin, um, it does actually change the smell of things because our skin can be a little bit more acidic than other hair colors. So it does change the way that a perfume that I would wear might smell different and and totally different on a blonde or a brunette. Um, And that is because of the makeup of our skin and the acidity does change the way we smell. That makes me wonder because my favorite scents are earthy scents like patchouli, cedar. You're just smelling yourself. I'm just, I love me. (laughs) There you go. That's you. (laughs) This was so fun. Thank you so much. Can we shout out where we can get this book and and other books that uh, Aaron, you write? Yeah, so all of my books, uh, The Big Redhead Book, For Better or Worse, Woman Skills, 
are available at Amazon, Barnes and Nobles, IndieBound, really wherever you buy books, I would suggest. Um, and if you find me on social, I usually have links in my profile to buy them. So feel free to do some holiday shopping. They're right around the corner. Awesome. It's yeah. been a treat, Aaron. Thank you so much for joining us today. You've been listening to the Authentic Ginger Podcast. Become a part of the Ginger Nation by liking, subscribing, following, and leaving a review wherever you listen to podcasts. This podcast was produced by Tosh Taylor of the Podcast Hub Productions. Find her online at podcasthub.ca.